Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Poetry Thursday, a little weekly event where I and a few other BookTubers read you a poem on Thursday. Most of the other BookTubers are content to read you a poem and go on their way. Uh, I read you a poem and make a psychodrama out of it, <laughs> because I am not just picking poems at random. I am going through 20th century American poetry, a big, heavy, good anthology that uh, has as its subject matter a period that I have always hated. So I am hoping that this will open my eyes, teach me a lot, maybe change a few old opinions. Uh, I haven't hated all of the 20th century in American poetry, but the, the damage that the 20th century American poetry did to the genre of poetry, I believe, is both vast and unfixable. And we are naturally, in the course of this book, we are going to encounter the people who inflicted that damage. We've already encountered a couple. Uh, but today, we're doing an oddity. I'm just going straight you know, page number order here. I'm not skipping around in this book. And today we're dealing with an oddity. If you have a, a bustling, healthy stream, every once in a while, one part of that stream will take a little side detour into a pond or a rivulet of some kind, and that will be just separate from the rest of the stream. Most of the wildlife that inhabits or deals with or uh, the, the rest of the stream will ignore that little rivulet. It will develop an ecosystem of its own, and that's what we're dealing with today. Uh, in this book, because we are now up to Robinson Jeffers, who had some early success as a poet, uh, did not like schools, did not like, not I mean, not academics, but schools of thought, schools of art, did not like fads, did not like any of the reigning fads. Right now in this book, we are in the heyday of the modernism. He didn't like any of that. He didn't really like people either. And eventually, he he was freakishly educated. He was freakishly intelligent. Eventually, he just decided to get away from it all. He went north in California to, to uh, Carmel, I think, when it was Neolithic, when it was, when it was not a city at all. And he just stayed there. <laughs> he just moved there and stayed there. He didn't care about prizes. He didn't care about awards. He didn't care about ceremonies. He didn't care about his peers. He didn't care about his sales. He didn't care about fads or his, uh, or critics or anything like that. He seemed only to care about the people in his orbit and his art. And he kept writing for a long time that way. Uh, it was only later in his life, it was in, I think, the 1940s, that he, uh, that he achieved a kind of what we would call viral success in the least way imaginable, the least, the least predictable way imaginable. Uh, Judith Anderson, an actress named Judith Anderson, who you will know, believe it or not, you, that name might not be familiar, but you've actually seen her. <laughs> you've actually seen her in a Star Trek movie. She took a role in a Star Trek movie as a Vulcan priestess because her children and grandchildren wanted her in a Star Trek movie. Uh, what, what you seek has not been done since ages past, and then only in legend. Your request is not logical. <laughs> she, uh, she's in Star Trek Three, But she, she and a bunch of other people convinced Robinson Jeffers to do a, an adaptation of Euripides' play Medea uh, for the stage. And it worked. To put it mildly, it worked. It was a gigantic theatrical success. Not only because of the oddity, the novelty of it, but also because it reminded people, theatergoers of all stripes, that we, we revere Euripides not just because we happen to have some of his plays, but because a lot of those plays are brilliant. Uh, and it, it set Robertson Jeffers up. I swear, you can just practically see the pained embarrassment on his face when he was opening the royalty statements as they came in the mail, while all he was doing was just beavering away at his, at his poetry. Uh, and as a result, because he is a little pool off from the mainstream, his poetry is a little odd. It's, I don't, after all this time reading and rereading him, I still don't know what to make of him. I'm assuming that the more poetically skilled among you will have better things to say, more interesting things, maybe teach me a lot about this poet. I certainly like him. I'm going to read you two of his poems today, uh, because I'm not going to read you any of the really long stuff. He did some really long stuff. I'm going to read you two of his poems to give you a, a flavor for it, in case you're not familiar with this poet. Uh, so the first one we will read is called To the Stonecutters. Stonecutters fighting time with marble, you four defeated challengers of oblivion, eat cynical earnings, knowing rock splits, records fall down, the square-limbed Roman letters scale in the thaws, wear in the rain. The poet as well builds his monument mockingly. For man will be blotted out, the blithe earth die, the brave sun die blind and blackened to the heart. Yet stones have stood for thousands of years. 
and a pain thoughts found the honey of peace in old poems. That's from 1924. And you, I think you can see a little bit of what I mean. First of all, it's, it's weird just in terms of metrics, in terms of, you know, it, could this be a, a work that invites our age-old question on Poetry Thursday of is it even poetry at all? I think so. I think it's, uh, poetry tends to be a, a, a thought that's whittled away to just bare musculature and nervous system. And that is very much this. And I like the turnaround at the end. You will find that often. This author is often uh, somewhat casually, in some poetry anthologies, referred to as very pessimistic, even nihilistic. That isn't true. That isn't true. He's harsh towards the world and towards himself. You get the strong impression. But there's always a glimmer of hope. I, in almost all the poems of his that I've read, I don't think I've read everything by him, but uh, in almost everything there's always a glimmer of hope. And he, so too in this. He's mentioning poets and stonecutters as people who are actively striving for immortality. They are actively hoping for the conceit that their work will last forever. And it's not going to. The narrator of the poem is assuring us right up front that it's not going to. It is for defeated. But it will have an accidental success, <laughs> which is, uh, is kind of weird. Stone carvings won't last forever, but they will last a thousand years. And poems that are meant forever won't last forever as living things, but they will be found every once in a while in books of old poetry, old and, uh, they're, you know, easy to read, toothless poetry, and they will soothe the right person at the right time. It's a limited version of that kind of immortality, but I like it. I, I think it's uh, limited but realistic. Uh, I want to do one more here uh, that's a little bit pointed. It was pointed in Jeffers' Day. It's pointed again in, the, in 2023. I won't harp on the pointedness, of course, since it's political and that has no place on Poetry Thursday, but it's called Ave Caesar. No bitterness. Our ancestors did it. They were only ignorant and hopeful. They wanted freedom, but wealth, too. Their children will learn to hope for a Caesar, or rather, for we are not aquiline Romans, but soft, mixed colonists, some kindly Sicilian tyrant who will keep poverty and Carthage off until the Romans arrive. We are easy to manage, a gregarious people, full of sentiment, clever at mechanics, and we love our luxuries. That's from 1935, and you can see in that a bit of the uh, misanthropic scold that Robertson Jeffers often character was often characterized. A lot of his contemporaries saw him that way, especially the poets for whom he had no time. They read things like that and thought, eh, okay, that, you're a little grim, aren't you? <laughs> uh, but... That is also beautiful. It, these things, his poems always remind me of just surgical strikes, which is, you know, not something given to most poets and not something that most poets would want to do. So that's Robertson Jeffers. I'm really tempted to read like five or six more poems. They're all really good. Uh, even the longer ones are really, really good. But I don't want these Poetry Thursday things to go on forever and ever. So we have a lot of ground to cover. So that's Robertson Jeffers. An odd side channel, definitely not part of any of the movements that we, that we have been dealing with, very much by his own intentional design. He left all of those behind. Didn't want anything to do with anybody. Uh, didn't even return Christmas cards. <laughs> so, so he was, uh, he's not the, the normal run of what we're dealing with. We are coming up now on a couple of major names who are in the normal run, who are very much in the main body of that stream. Uh, the next one is a highlight for me. Uh, a poet that I love, an American poet that I love, may be the last po American poet in this anthology that I, una that I unqualifiedly love. Although maybe not. I can think of a couple of others. Uh, and then following that poet is a poet who is every bit as major, much more major, who I don't love, who I don't like at all. And I'm curious to know, when, we, when we're looking back on Poetry Thursday, not that anybody's going to be masochistic enough to do that, I have had many people say, how can you like the one and not like the other one? They're so similar. I wonder, first of all, I wonder if I will dislike the second poet as much as I like the first one, or will that change? And second, if I do, I'm wondering if I or you will see the reasons why. We'll be able to quantify the reasons why. That will all be interesting. This is all Poetry Thursday. It's all interesting for me. I'm taking you through this, this psychodrama of going through one book. Uh, so that is it for today. Uh, that is uh, Robinson Jeffers. Uh, odd, complicated poet. So... Uh, we'll wrap this up for now. I'll see you next Thursday. <laughs> Thank you, Book 2.